Hey everybody, welcome to Bible Prophecy Talk. My name is Chris, and this is part six of the Gog Magog War Study. This study will be presented as a video as well as an audio podcast. You can go to the website Bible Prophecy Talk to subscribe to the podcast or to find links to the video. I've titled part six, The World of Gog and Magog. And what I mean by that is, what can we gather about the world described in Ezekiel 38 and 39? So we'll talk about the attributes of the people, attributes of the land, the types of weapons that they're using, what this valley of the travelers is, why, why they're burying bodies for seven months or burning weapons for seven years. Basically, I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to springboard to a lot of interesting things in these chapters, and I think it'll be a pretty interesting part in this series. We've already covered a lot here in the previous parts, and one of the things that I feel like we've covered to a pretty good extent is the idea of the dwelling securely and the dwelling without bars or gates and all that stuff. Um, you know, I've made my case, I think, that the latter years here refers to the time after the millennium. If you haven't seen the other parts, I highly encourage you to check that out. There are so many different places we could go and rabbit trails that we can follow in this section. I think I'll pretty much start at random with this idea of the waste places being rebuilt because I think it helps to show something about the nature of the land of Ezekiel 38 and 39. The first premise I want to support is that this idea of rebuilt waste places is a theme within the uh, six night messages, which began in Ezekiel 33 and continue to Ezekiel 39, which are part of the same section. So Ezekiel 38, eight says, after many days, you will be mustered in the latter years. You will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples now dwell securely, all of them. Ezekiel 38, 12 in the same Gog Magog section to seize spoil and carry off plunder to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people who were gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, blah, 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 who dwell at the center of the earth, something we'll come back to later. Ezekiel 36.10, which is a part of the night messages, and I would argue is a millennial passage, but you don't have to believe me about that right now. And I will multiply you, the whole house of Israel, all of it, the cities shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. Also in Ezekiel 36, this is verse 33, thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. The next premise I want to support is that rebuilt waste places are a theme in millennial passages. This is especially true in Isaiah, where it's all over the place. Isaiah 61, uh, 1 through 6, Isaiah 44, 26, Isaiah 49, 8, Isaiah 51, 3, Isaiah 65, 21. All of those are explicitly millennial passages that talk about the waste places being rebuilt. I'm just going to read one of those, Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the news of the poor and has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the verse that Jesus quotes. He actually ends that quote right there. Uh, Missler always makes a point that it's a good thing he did because the next part is a, a sort of far fulfillment that will begin with the day of the Lord and his second return. But he continues, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And while I think that there is language here that applies to the new covenant, I also think that there's language here that applies to the millennium. If you are not convinced by the Isaiah passage here, please check out the other four passages I've listed on the screen or mentioned earlier. Let's move on to Amos, who says in Amos 9, 11 through 15, they'll all start a little bit later. Uh, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and shall make gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them. 
Some concluding thoughts on this waste places idea. Number one, inhabiting rebuilt waste places in Israel is a consistent theme in the night messages, Ezekiel 33 through 39. Number two, inhabiting rebuilt waste places is a consistent theme in passages about the millennium. Number three, some of those passages make it clear that the day of the Lord comes before this inhabitation of waste places, Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. The waste places seem to be a reference to the destruction caused by the day of the Lord. Therefore, it is logical that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a reference to the millennium after the day of the Lord. Another aspect of the world of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that the people of Israel are described as being fruitful. It says that they have a livestock in two verses. It mentions that they have, quote, goods, which is a term that's sometimes translated as riches, basically means things acquired by purchasing. They have silver and gold. They have, quote, great spoil. And their fruitfulness is a big part of this story because it's actually the, the, their, the stuff that they have that makes Gog and the armies, apparently, it's one of the motivations or maybe the primary motivation for them wanting to attack them is their fruitfulness. The first thing that I would like to support is the idea that a fruitful land is a big concept in the Ezekiel night messages, starting in Ezekiel 33. And if you remember the context part that we did here in this study, that those passages can be easily shown to be a part of the millennium. I think it's obvious from the context, but it, it's also obvious because the Messiah is there. Remember, it's an encouragement that, hey, yes, you're going into captivity right now to Babylon, but things are going to be okay in the millennium when the promises actually come true and all this other stuff. So let me just read a couple of them. I've got five here on the screen. Ezekiel 34, 29 says, and I will provide for them renowned plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And I will multiply you man and beast and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to, and by the way, if you're thinking, well, they're going to be reproached by the nations, but well, that concept has developed other places about them the, the nations would reproach them because they had famines. So that's the concept that we see in other places in the Bible is that the nations would point to you and say, ah, your God isn't very good because you have a famine and you have to go to Egypt. So they're saying they're not going to be reproached anymore because there will be no more hunger in the land because they will have so much. Uh, but continuing uh, Ezekiel 36, 11, I will multiply you man and beast and they shall multiply, be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times and will do more good to you than ever before. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 29 through 30, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no more famine upon you and I'll make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. The fruitfulness of the land in the millennium is also a theme in other passages such as Isaiah 60, 6 through 17, an obvious millennial passage. I won't read the whole thing here, but flocks are gathered to them, gold and frankincense, silver and gold, the same phrase actually used in Ezekiel 38 and 39. You could find lots of passages like this. I will just simply say that the fruitful Israel concept is a big part of millennial passages, and it's also a big part of the Ezekiel 38 and 39 story. Here's an interesting one, the center of the earth. Ezekiel 38, 12 says, to see spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people who were gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth. Before we get to the center of the earth idea, I did want to quickly mention the gathering from the nations aspect, because I know it's sort of um, you know, triggering some people that are thinking, well, hey, that happened in 1948 or 67, of which I described in the context section, I think what it was at part two, that it certainly, you know, could be a near fulfillment, but it doesn't fulfill all the things that are talked about in that section that will uh, be a part of the far fulfillment. The far fulfillment gathering of the nations happens during the day of the Lord. The, that, the, that is to say, the ultimate gathering must be then. And one of the reasons I can prove that is that, that I think we read the passage earlier, that they will never lose the nation again once their this end times in gathering occurs. And yet we know from the several places, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus tells them to flee Jerusalem when they see the abomination of desolation. We know from Revelation 12 that they flee to the wilderness to uh, escape the persecution of Satan during the three and a, four, three and a half years. There is a gathering that happens right at the end of the day of the Lord. It's that gathering who's gathered from the nations, not the one in 1948 and 67. I'm not saying 67 or 48 was a bad thing or that uh, it wasn't a near fulfillment. It's just that it can't be this gathering. And I think I'll do an entire section to prove that because it's a big deal and I know people uh, think about it a lot. Anyway, moving back to our verse about the center of the earth. 
What does that mean? Well, it could mean what it means in Ezekiel 5, 5, which says, thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. It could be as simple as that, that the word center there in that passage is tavek, which is a very common word for center. It's used 415 times in the Bible. Basically, if anything is in the center of something, it's using the word tavek. So it could mean that. The problem is that is not the word used in our verse in Ezekiel 38, 12, which says the people who were gathered from the nations, who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth. In that case, the word is tabur, and it's very rare. It's only used twice in the Bible. The other time is in Judges 9.37, which says, Gal spoke and said, Look, people are coming down from the center of the land, and one company is coming from the direction of the Diviner's Oak. Here's the Lexham Bible entry for the phrase. It says, The center of the land occurs in only two passages in Scripture, Judges 9.37 and Ezekiel 38.12. The exact meaning of the phrase is debated, in part due to its use of the word translated here as center, tabur, which does not appear elsewhere in the Bible. The limited usage of this term, along with its uncertain etymology, makes it difficult to determine its exact meaning. Two common suggestions for the meaning of the phrase include, number one, it is related to the mythical idea of the navel of the earth, and number two, it refers to an elevated location that offers security. An elevated location that offers security. Well, that's interesting in light of what we know about Jerusalem in the millennium and in the eternal kingdom. I'll read this passage from Isaiah 2, 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Another interesting one is from Zechariah 14, 10 through 11, because not only does it mention the elevated location, but an elevated location that offers security. It says, The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site, from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter, utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. So there's this idea that Jerusalem in the millennium will be on this great plain. It will remain aloft while everything around it is flat. I would say this idea that the city is this high up thing and the rest of it is flat is also described in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, where it describes the cubits being 12,000 stadia and the length, width, and height are all, all the same. So it's this huge thing that's basically the size of the entire Middle East. Maybe it corresponds to um, uh, greater Israel, I don't know. But in any case, the, 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 the New Jerusalem is this huge, tall thing. But the point is, this rare word for center in Ezekiel 38, 12, which can mean, according to the lexicon, an elevated location that offers security, could be a direct link to at least the Jerusalem in the millennium being described as a plateau or a, a hill while everything else being flat. And we'll look later about how that happens specifically. But that is a theme in the millennium and to a lesser degree in the New Jerusalem All right, let's move on to the types of weapons that Gog and his armies are said to use in Ezekiel 38 and 39. These include horses and horsemen, full armor, buckler, shield, swords, helmets, bows and arrows, clubs, and spears. So the issue is that these are obviously old-timey weapons, and that causes a problem for many who I believe have incorrect views about the timing of Ezekiel 38 and 39 because they typically want the battle to be fought very soon in relation to their lifetime and cannot conceive of a world which uses these weapons. One popular way around this is to just say that they are allegorical. That is to say that Ezekiel was using terms his readers would understand or something like that, that these these are just symbolic words for uh, modern weaponry. And that's certainly the way that people like Chuck Missler who insists that these uh, were symbols for nuclear weapons, a a theory that we'll look at in a minute, have said. Uh, But I would say these things are typically refuted, as we'll see, uh, with the way that it describes them, because I don't think it gives you an out to make them allegorical. I think you need to understand, for example, these as wooden weapons, but we'll get to that in a minute. 
Another option is people who still think the war is a modern war and that modern weapons of war will be used, but are not as willing to say that the passage is allegorical. An example of that would be John Walvoord, who says, Such an interpretation, too, has problems. We are told in the passage that they used the wooden shafts of the spears and the bow and the arrows for kindling wood. If these are symbols, it would be difficult to burn symbols. However, even in modern warfare, there is a good deal of wood used. Possibly this is the explanation. We are not in a position today to settle this problem with any finality. So he basically says, you know, we can't know. And I would say it's a little bit worse than that because it even talks about, as we'll see later, that it talks about, well, they don't need to go to the forest and chop down trees anymore because they have so much wood. It really drives the point home that, yes, this is wood being used. Another option is the one that I think is the case, and that is that the war takes place at a time when modern weapons of war are not available. And this, of course, is because I hold the view that the Gog Magog War occurs when John says it does in Revelation 20, verse 7, that is, after the thousand years of peace. I think there's a direct connection, obviously, between the peace of the millennium and the language of peace in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the dwelling securely, having neither bars nor gates, unwalled villages, in other words, there is no need for weapons in this uh, abundant peace, which seems to be emphasized. Let's talk about the burning of the weapons for seven years, because there is a lot to talk about with this passage. So Ezekiel 39, 9 through 10 says, Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires of the weapons and burn them, shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, clubs and spears, and they will make fires of them for seven years so that they will not need to take wood out of the field or cut down any out of the forests, for they will make their fires of the weapons. First, as I alluded to earlier, this phrase that they will not need to take wood out of the field or cut down any out of the forests, for they will make their fires of the weapons, seems to really enforce that this is literal wood and literal weapons that is specifically mentioned, and it really kind of diminishes the idea that these are allegorical terms. Those that want this to be a modern war do look at this allegorically, and they'll say things like, these weapons are tanks and bombs and, and helicopters and things like that, and they're taking, for example, the gas out of the, the fuel tanks and using that for energy, or in some cases I mentioned, like Missler says that part of it were you know nuclear missiles and things like that. They took the warheads and sort of converted them to make energy. But that is, I think, is pretty obvious eisegesis here. It's not in the text. What is in the text is a very plain reading, what I think is actually emphasizing the idea that it's wood and they are literally making fires with that wood. So the idea here is that the wooden weapons and the simpler times are a uh, attribute of the millennium. So I have a little chart here that says Millennium 101 with five items on it that I don't think many people would disagree with and I could back them up with many verses. Jesus will reign as king of the world from Jerusalem. There will be worldwide peace in the millennium. The earth itself will be restored to a pristine condition. All the earth's fierce creatures will become tame and docile. And life will return to simpler times. Admittedly, that last one, which is sort of the key one for this thing, is harder to prove. I can't prove to you that things go back to a simpler time in the millennium. I've got something like six or so verses on the screen here, and they are describing the world of the millennium, and there is terms like flocks and plowmen and vine dressers and, and all these ideas, but it's mostly about agricultural stuff. So there'll be certainly agriculture and work to some degree in the millennium, but it's not necessarily saying it's simpler times. In other words, there can be agriculture and have modern stuff around and computers and stuff, I suppose, certainly. So I can't prove it, but I do think that that this is suggestive, at least, that things go back to a simpler time uh, in the millennium. Another thing about the burning of these weapons is that it's easy to miss the forest for the trees here because the point of this passage, at least one of the points, seems to be that the burning of these weapons for seven years is a way to show how many people went to war here. It's an astounding number. I think John emphasizes that in Revelation 20 when he says that their number was like the sand of the sea. And it's one of the few things that John sort of picks out in his three verse summary of these two chapters, chapters to say, this is an important point. The, the, the number was huge. As Ezekiel seems to be saying here that you were able to burn their weapons for seven years. That's a lot of people. So there's a lesson there. I think I could hypothesize what that lesson is that, you know, even after perfect government, this huge number went to war against God. There's something there. 
I don't know exactly what it is, but I could look at it later. But that's the first thing, is that we shouldn't miss the main point of the passage in pursuit of all of our pet theories. One common objection to the millennial timing of the Gog Magog War is that it would mean that there will be seven years of burning weapons in the Eternal Kingdom. They will say things like this from Nathan E. Jones, quote, Israel would have no reason to burn the invader's weapons into the perfect eternal state. I think arguments like that are well-meaning, but they should be admitted that they are arguments from absence. We just don't know a lot about the eternal kingdom. I mean, Revelation 21 and 22 gives us some information about the eternal kingdom, but there's not a lot out there. Certainly not a lot of information about what's happening outside the city, but there is, as we'll see, a suggestion that there is something going on out there. I would say there is something to it because, for example, it says that inside the city of the New Jerusalem, they don't need um, you know, any light because the Lord is there and he provides the light. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about warmth, and that is certainly one of the reasons that you would need fires, that is to say for warmth, but also for cooking. But light within the city is not needed, but that does not seem to apply to outside the city, which, as I said, is a thing. So let's read um, from Revelation 21, 16 through 27. I'll start towards the end. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the, is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter, enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So remember, the New Jerusalem after the millennium comes down from heaven. So during the thousand years, people that have died, you know, from eternity past and, you know, during the day of the Lord or whatever, that are with the Lord, that are in his kingdom, are literally in heaven during that entire time. And it seems that the millennium is populated by, for example, people that survived the day of the Lord, the 144,000 and their descendants for that a thousand years, the sheep and goat judgment, all that stuff. And then the new Jerusalem, the people that literally with new glorified bodies, and remember, these are not ghosts. These are real people in a real city that comes down and has real dimensions and, and sits down basically on the entire Middle East. But it says the gates are not uh, uh, closed, but there is a suggestion that nations are still there and there's still something happening in the world, which I think is fascinating and kind of cool. Um, but something is happening outside the city too. I think you can glean that from this passage. So my point here is that we don't know. We don't know what's going on. We don't know if fires need to be, uh, can't be burned. In other words, the idea that, oh, you don't need to burn fires in the eternal kingdom. I know everything about the eternal kingdom and fires are not needed is a nonsense statement, really, because we just don't have enough information to know that. I would also say that there is no time frame given between the end of the Gog Magog War and the descent of the New Jerusalem. We don't know how much time transpires between one or the other. I mean, is it immediately after Gog is defeated? Is that when the New Jerusalem just starts descending from the sky? We don't know. Is it a minute? Is it an hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it on and on and on. Let's move on to the idea of the Valley of the Travelers. This is an interesting one, and I'll just read from Ezekiel 39, 11 through 16. On that day, I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the Valley of the Travelers, east of the sea. It will block the travelers, for there Gog and all his multitude will be buried. It will be called the Valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them. It will, be, it will bring them renown on the day that I show my glory, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury those travelers remaining on the face of the land so as to cleanse it. At the end of the seven months, they will make their search. And when these travel through the land and anyone sees a human bone, then he shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. Hamona is also the name of the city. Thus shall they cleanse the land. First, you should know that there's no consensus about where this place is, Hamona or Haman Gog, which basically means the multitude of Gog. This is an entry from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, which says, Hamona, the name of the city in the valley in Ezekiel 39, 16, where the armies of Gog will be buried after their destruction. This is the only occurrence of the name and its location is unknown. I spent a lot of time in this study trying to figure out the location of the Valley of the Travelers, but just kept coming up empty-handed. It seemed like there were some clues that could lead there. For example, this phrase, east of the sea, as the ESV has it. 
but it's pretty general. That term sea just can mean sea. It's the Mediterranean Sea or the Sea of Galilee or the Dead Sea or some future sea. It, it's not known. Even the phrase east of the sea is not something that leads you anywhere. It's kind of a dead end as well. So, and then add to that, other Bible translations say something different about that. They say things like, in the valley of those who travel east of the sea, as if it's talking about people in Jerusalem that want to travel east of the sea, this is a valley that they would go to. Add to that the idea that there is nowhere with these names, Hamangag, Hamona, or anything like that in history. And it led me to another possibility, which is that this topography doesn't exist yet, and so it is essentially meaningless to try to figure this out. So let me try to prove that to you. First, I think everybody would agree that in Revelation 16, 17 through 20, major cataclysms happen. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, pearls of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was the earthquake, the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath, and every island fled away, and no more mountains were to be found. So if that's to be taken anywhere close to literally, major topographical changes will happen at the end of the day of the Lord. Now let's look at two obvious millennial passages that talk about this new topography. Isaiah 40 verse 4, Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Isaiah 49 11, And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Uh, Zechariah 14, The whole land shall be turned into a plain. Isaiah 2 2, The house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and it shall be lifted up above all the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. So my only point here is that major topographical changes happen after the day of the Lord. So if this valley of the travelers is in or after the day of the Lord, then we shouldn't expect to be able to find a valley as it stands today being the same valley. It just things will change. One big question is, who are the travelers in this passage? So remember, it sort of has a proper name, the Valley of the Travelers, and it will block the travelers. So it's something about these travelers. Who are these travelers? And the question is actually kind of complicated, and lots of people have lots of different opinions, everything from them being pilgrims going to and from Jerusalem, which is the view I currently favor, to them being demon spirits, which is a um, another thing I've heard and doing this study. It's made even more difficult because a plain reading of this passage in the ESV could have the travelers be a reference to pilgrims traveling to and from Jerusalem, but it also could be a reference to those that are assigned to bury the bones in the cleansing operation. So in the ESV it says, On that day I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the valley of the travelers, east of the sea. It will block the travelers. For there Gog and his multitude will be buried. So it sounds like so far that the travelers may be something that's blocking them. It's a valley that they used. So kind of an, um, ambiguous there. But Gog and his uh, multitude will sort of inhibit that. So it's going to be called also, I guess, the Valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them, and it will bring them renown on the day that I show my glory, declares the Lord. They will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury those travelers. So there it kind of sounds like the men who are set aside, they're set aside to travel through the land. Why is it using that word travel there? It's kind of an odd thing regularly and bury those travelers. So now both the men burying and those that are being buried are both called travelers in the ESV. It makes it even weirder when you get down to, and when these travel through the land and anyone sees a human bone, so now it's back to calling the barriers travelers. So we've got essentially three people here that could be the travelers. First, the initial people that are being blocked by Gog and his multitude. Now we have the people that are set out to remedy that situation. They're being called travelers. And the people that are being buried are called travelers in the ESV. What seems to be happening is that the word for traveler here is really common. It's used 559 times in the Old Testament. It can mean pass, went, went over, pass, pass through, pass by, go, put, pass by, to emigrate, to vanish, to perish, to become invalid, to... Uh, I mean, there's so many different ways to use it. In fact, in this uh, lexicon reference, it has 123 instances of just miscellaneous use. So it can mean a lot of different things. 
But in this first part, it's obviously trying to make it a technical term. It's calling it the Valley of the Travelers, like it's a proper name. And that second part seems to be related to that, that they'll block the way of the travelers. So those two seem to be connected. So that's probably a good translation. But the others are just talking about things in the narrative that you would normally use this word for. Like he's gonna, these people are passing from here to there, burying bones and doing all this stuff. And so it's unnecessary to translate each one of those normal, very common words as traveler like the ESV does, because it obviously has caused a lot of contradictions. Now you've got three different, obviously contradictory travelers in this verse. I think the Net Bible has it right. The Net Bible calls those first two travelers where it just uses the term scouts in the following references to sort of describe those that are doing the burying and stuff. So we still have the problem of we don't know who the travelers were, are, but they're, it, it, it reduces the confusion a little bit. I would hypothesize that the travelers are the pilgrims, the masses of people that will be traveling both to and from Jerusalem in the millennium, so much that the term is a highway when it speaks of this, or sometimes when it speaks of this, sometimes called the highway of holiness. Just a few verses here, Isaiah 19.23, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come to, uh, into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. Isaiah 62.10, go through and through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, cleared of stones, lift up the signal over the peoples. Isaiah 11.16, and there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people, and there uh, was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. But it's not just Egypt and Assyria that will be uh, traveling on that particular highway, but the whole world will flow to and from Jerusalem to pay respects to uh, the Lord there. So, so I do know that there are a lot of travelers in the millennium. I can't prove that these travelers are the same that Ezekiel is talking about, but it would make sense. Again, it's just a hypothesis. Let's move on to the idea that they buried bodies for seven months and they set out people to do that specifically. And according to my theory, this is happening during the millennium. How am I going to explain any of this? Well, I would say that this is one of those areas that Chuck Missler would use to prove that nuclear weapons were involved. He would say that the reasons that they put a little sign next to the bones is because these people were destroyed by nuclear weapons, and so the bones were radioactive, which I would, I would point out is actually a different theory than his previous thing about using nuclear warheads to power the millennium. But So it's not like it ties into one another. They're two separate theories that you have to believe, but I think it's also eisegesis, but it's a little bit better in this case, because why put little signs next to, next to the bones? What are they, are they like, do they think that they're dangerous bones? Are they just doing this to say, hey, here's another bone, make sure we bury this? Why the meticulous nature of burying these bones? The first thing I would point out is that three times in this passage, it mentions that the purpose for burying these bones is to cleanse the land. Well, so far, that doesn't give us much of a explanation. You could say that that's what they would do if this was, you know, radioactive material. So they would also want to cleanse the land. But there is another option. I'll read first from Numbers 19.16, which says, Whoever in the open field touches someone who was killed with a sword or who died naturally or touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Another one from Numbers 19.11-12. Whoever touches the dead body of a person shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. So there is a lot there. For example, the references to cleansing the land make sense if bones make certainly people ritually unclean. So the idea of sending people out to cleanse the land can be a reference to their personal uncleanness. Uh, or it could be the land. I think it is the land that is unclean for seven months. And even though seven days was mentioned in those other passages, I think there are other examples of scripture. You can prove me wrong or right on that, but where these Levitical time periods are expanded with those different ratios for different applications. It also seems like this seven month time period is set ahead of time. That is to say, it's not as though the Bible is telling us in a prophetic way, it will take them this long to cleanse the land, as if they didn't know how long it took, but the Bible did. Instead, it seems to be saying that they will agree ahead of time that it will take them seven months, and then after that seven months, they will do this, this, and this, which would seem to lend credence to the idea that they knew the time period that the land would need to be clean 
after this, regardless of the amount of burying the bodies, because that's when they actually set the signs up by it. Which, again, I think the meticulous nature of the setting up signs by bones till the barriers have buried that particular bone is a reference to what you would do if a bone could make somebody or something, the land, unclean. Another theory is that the travelers are a reference to like the watchers, the angels that send that were imprisoned in the abyss and the valley of the travelers is speaking, I guess, of the place that they are, um, I guess, imprisoned or something like that. And the idea is that he goes to Revelation 20 and he says, look, at the end of the Gog Magog war in Revelation 20, it says that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So in that passage, you have the Gog Magog war, you know, pretty obviously. And then you have Satan being uh, put in this pit. And so he says it's parallel to the Ezekiel 39 passage in which you have the Gog Magog war followed by Gog and his armies being buried. So he's saying essentially they are the same passages, kind of an allegorical thing of the same thing. So that's step one. I've got a lot of problems with step one. I think the first is that it necessarily means that one of these passages is, I hesitate to use the word wrong, but that's basically what it amounts to. He kind of makes the point that, hey, you know, we shouldn't look at the Bible literally. You know, that's not way the way to do it. And what he's trying to do in his case, I believe it's Ezekiel 39. He wants to sort of relegate to complete allegory, which means that you have to believe that Ezekiel 39 just isn't real. I mean, there isn't going to be a burying of the bodies for seven months. They aren't going to send these people out with jobs to put up little signs by the thing. It's just that's totally allegorical, an allegorical symbol of Satan being thrown into the lake of fire. And I think that he defaults to Revelation 20 being a literal thing because that's sort of his wheelhouse, right? That's, uh, uh, you know, the supernatural worldview and everything. That I, I'm pretty sure that he believes that Satan will actually be thrown into the abyss, and that's not allegorical, but more or less literal, which is kind of ironic because in another passage in that same thing, he says that this passage, Revelation 20, is allegorical and we shouldn't pay attention to it and think about it literally, but that's a whole other thing. Step two in this process is to talk about the word for traveler. And we've already looked at this word. This is the one that I've made the case was very common. It means to pass, to pass through, to went, to pass by. A very common word. It does not have any technical meaning for uh, demon or watchers or angel or anything like that, or really anything else. I mean, it just means what it means in the Bible, although it can mean a lot of different things, but it's not a technical term for anything in the Bible. So what he then does is go to a Ugaritic text in which a, I guess it's a group of gods, maybe it was some kind of uh, the, the Rephaim or something like that, was described as being the Abarim, those who pass through or pass by, I guess, would be the translation which would be a reference to them, you know, passing from one world to the next, either from the underworld to the overworld or vice versa or something like that. Something that you would probably think is a fairly common thing that gods in the ancient world would do, given how common this term is to describe things like that, to pass, to pass through, to pass over, or whatever. So while it's not impossible that that's what this could mean, it certainly doesn't have the kind of support I'm certainly used to seeing to agree that something is true or not true about the Bible. I, I would consider this a weak argument that could be true, but I would need something else besides that. Given how common this word is and how likely it would be to see this in that context, especially without any biblical or interbiblical evidence of that being the way this word should be understood. But of course, the big one is that the argument is predicated on the idea that Ezekiel 39 really isn't true in the sense that I think things are true. That is to say, it shouldn't be understood as a, in a face value hermeneutic, that Ezekiel says these people will bury people for seven uh, months and that's what's going to happen, as opposed to that's not really what happens. That's just not how I understand the Bible. And so therefore I can't, I can't entertain that idea. That's not to say I disagree with the supernatural aspect. I'm going to talk about some of those things as we get into other parts of this study. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me at chriswhite79 at protonmail.com, and I'll try to get back with you. No promises on that, though. You can also go to the website bibleprophecytalk.com, and I will see you next time. Thanks.